Okay, Isabel, thank you, thank you for doing this. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, you were on the podcast with Kenneth? No, oh yeah, with Kenneth. Yeah, that's... that's Not the other Kenneth. <laughs> that's a conversation I like. The Kenneth, Kenneth, my elder brother, please. That one, you vote him, shout out to you, vote <laughs> Woo, hire them guys. Mm-hmm. It's a conversation I really, really, really like, right? Like, I like how you guys were speaking on Kanye. Kanye's like my favorite artist. Yeah, you're obsessed, fam. Somehow like that. So... Uh, I like how you both spoke on like uh, your issues, like your mental issues. So that's the thing. Like, mm-hmm, it was mm-hmm. Kenneth's first time to talk on that. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Like, okay, good. You're coming on my G. Yeah, 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 yeah. You dig it, you dig it, you dig it. Dig into the uncomfortable mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. Exactly. So I like that. Then the fact that you performed at Oktoberfest, something I have poured my whole life into. Mm. For oh, like so it as well. Great job, you've I think that you liked it. So, that uh, let's start there. Mm-hmm. You performing at Oktoberfest. Mm-hmm. Your music. Uh, let, let me let me take you behind the scenes. Uh-huh. So I bring you up in that boardroom discussion, right? <laughs> Sissy Dennis, assume where. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone is like, okay, no, Dennis had no objection, right? Okay. Uh, so, but there were like about other nine guys in, on the boardroom, mm-hmm. and we're like. Fine, she sings well, but no one knows her, all that stuff, all that stuff. Like, okay, we, we it's a marketing thing. I was like, no, she sings well, and that's all we need to really put out there. Mm. Like, let people appreciate. It's a festival. Let people appreciate new talent. Let mm-hmm. them appreciate very good music. Mm-hmm. Let us introduce something they can actually grow into, right? Mm-hmm. How do you, how are you using your music? What does the music mean to you? yeah yeah like um i think it's something i mentioned the last time with kenneth that my principle that has been really tested lately is that art and its expression always is first for the artist um when you look at the creative process and like even just mine thoughts turning into lyrics turning into a song begin with my own experiences my own ruminations and then come to a stage let's say oktoberfest so I think the times I have neglected or deprioritized that principle, I've really suffered as a person. And um, yeah, there's been this quote, I think it's by Charles Bukowski as well. It's like, you betrayed yourself and it was all for nothing. Like the times I have done different music or used a different process, not because it's a bad process or it's not good music, but it's just not coherent with the dynamism of my journey as an artist and for me that's what's important so yeah yeah yeah. october 1st is a big deal i'm so thankful for the opportunity and even just understanding like the history of the festival because that's what i'm about i'm like why are we celebrating a german beer uh festival in in uganda and like what some of those things stand for are personal i think aspects or salient aspects I have embodied in my whole life, right? Mm-hmm. Because like, and it's also something I mentioned with Kenneth, because like, I'm a Ugandan, but what's Ugandan about me? Yeah. I'm like the globalized, post-colonial hybrid Ugandan mm-hmm. that is listening to music from other countries and to be involved in something like that is important. I mean, I did German in my high school and you had to do it because the prerequisites in school, you have to do one language, right? Mm-hmm. But I kept on trying to rationalize the use of that. Like, why isn't it Luganda and like Runyankode? It's French and German because this is the reality of the world we live in. It's a globalized world. And for me, it was really amazing to just remember my Kalito German and like speak it for a point at the show and just see like heads turn in acknowledgement and see people respond. So I think for me, that was the highlight to like be able to tell people, hi, I'm Isabel UG. I'm a Ugandan with my own story, but I'm meeting you in your own culture celebration. For me, that was my highlight. I know it's really, I don't know. It's not, I don't think it's normal, but like that's where it is for me. That was, that was a highlight. What Oktoberfest in Uganda stands for. That's why it was important for me to do it. It's yeah. cool. How are you using these performances to connect to your fans? Like say to, mm-hmm. I see the comments that come up, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, when people find out about your music and it's the same experience with me. Mm-hmm. I'm like, wow, this is good. I need, I need to be listening to this. Mm-hmm. Like, I have about 12 songs of yours on my playlist. And because I love to listen to the songs mm-hmm. on there, like it's, it's new sound I'm introducing to myself and it's sound I'd love to listen to. Yeah. So 
what are you doing? What's that magic? As I said, a strange thing is when I'm on stage, I'm not really thinking about other people. <laughs> I'm thinking about myself. So Oktoberfest was interesting because I think for the first time on like that scale of a stage, I saw people in the crowd singing my songs. Songs that came out this year, word for word. And that was heavy. I was in a shock. Like there's a moment I had to remind myself, you need to keep singing, <laughs> you know, because that's never happened. I'd, I've become so comfortable with the fact that those will be the comments. Not that mm. they're bad. I think I also got over that in a sense. I mean, the comments are, Bambi, I am Babulonji. Nah, Uganda is not ready for that. Like, so music is not the, you know, like the stage right now. Or like, are you even Ugandan? People don't understand that. ETC, ETC. And I'm like, that's okay. Because that's the truth of our musical journey right now as well. So... When I go up on stage and with the people I usually go up on, it's like, guys, primary objective one, let us enjoy ourselves. You know, people will find us in our own comfort of expression and an art. So it's not necessarily, yeah, 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 I have to get all the notes right or yeah, yeah, I need to like engage and make the crowd interactive and... But you manage to like voice... The thing that stood out for me, right? Mm -hmm. I was trying to record the whole performance. So you managed to voice the sound in these speakers and to bring it out. How much practice? Like, How are you doing it? And, and it's not so easy. I've seen, I don't want to mention names. Mm -hmm. People have called me out for mentioning their names on my podcast. But I've seen people I really like mm -hmm. perform. Like artists I manage myself mm -hmm. and they have failed to do that. Like they have failed to bring out how you listen to the song through earbuds to how the song comes out while they're performing it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not that easy, but you, you did that. Let me shock you. Like, I think October 1st is some of the worst of song to be. Really? <laughs> yeah. Cause like I had a cold, um, my son is always picking up colds from daycare. And then the night before it had rained, you know how it usually rains. And I sleep right by the window and I just like breathe all that cold air in. And uh, when it rained, I didn't wake up to close the window. And so I woke up with like inflamed, an inflamed throat, like a case of, uh, of like my sinuses being just like today, it's not happening. So my voice wasn't like in the best place, but at the same time, it's only performances that can help you do better performances. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I like performances. Um, sometimes it's, you have to prioritize what you're getting. I mean, it's a big stage, yeah. Um, the money's good. Maybe, um, I don't know, whatever it might be. But for me, as an artist, I grow in my ability to interact. One very simple example is there's only two stages I've done at the scale of like Oktoberfest. Blankets and wine in August yeah. and Oktoberfest. And like everyone can tell you was backstage before Blankets and wine. Guys were like, sure you're going to not collapse on stage like did that had to come tell me babes you need to get it together i remember this, this is like i think a friend who came and said okay like i don't do this for people but like breathe in breathe out with me like i was panicking and then i stood up on stage and somehow found this place and this pocket to like express myself but you can see from where i stood on a stage as big as blankets was just right by the mic stand i didn't move but like with that knowledge going to Oktoberfest, I was like, no, 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 there's a stage, there's movement that can happen to engage people. And I was like, have that in mind, like move to the front, move to the back, you know, like wave energy to the crowd, wave energy back at the band, like synergize all those spaces and all those people participating in this experience that is your performance. And like, you can only learn that from from doing it because I yeah. mean you watch performances and that's something I also really heavily do I'm like how is Blankets and Wine going to be different from Oktoberfest and you watch a couple of videos and be like okay but in what I've seen what's true to me what am I able to manage and there's this theorizing you can do like I should explore that I should try this but in the end it only translates in real time so yeah I think the more you perform the better you are at performing and it's like a running joke like you know how there's that viral video of like Ariana Grande, I think, performing at, was it the Billboard Music Awards or like yeah. the VMAs? Yeah. And she's just started dancing and she's dancing in like such a timid way. And like Rihanna is snickering or Dua Lipa. 
like when she began she wasn't also dancing really well but like there's that tiktok clip that went by of like her first performances and now how she is on tour she's like a beast you know are you going to adopt to like are you going to start dancing dude i'm such a two left feet dancer i don't know what happened <laughs> okay i wasn't always the practice. best dancer yeah but like at the same time what i incorporate into my art has to be necessary right mm -hmm. and the measure of necessary is where am i where am i in life like if i feel like yeah yeah let's try this this like do a dancing song let's do it but if i don't feel like it i don't have to so some sometimes i just wait for that wave to hit uh but for sure like i have friends and like artists i know who are like really great dancers and really great singers and i've kept on encouraging them um the fact that there's a space for such talented performers so one of the people that fits that description is Kasten Yeso Anjagala who's just an amazing performer he's an amazing singer he's an amazing dancer he's an amazing person and one of the highlights of Blankets and Wine this August was just to watch him do his thing like I got a sneak peek into like his rehearsals during that time and I was just like na 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 I want that full shock effect <laughs> so I went down to the stands to see him and I feel there's such a space for that it's very Michael Jackson, Beyonce is like you're just a powerhouse with what you're able to do. It's not just singularly dimensional, but like you want me to dance, I can do it Chris Brown style. You want me to sing, I can sing. Like so, I think it's something we need to tap into, especially with the movement of like visuals. A person singing and dancing, those visuals are going to really travel. So. So you're gonna do it. Man. We shall see. Basically, we'll see. what like the mind is like. Time to dance, or we can dance. We'll do it. Yeah, but I think at the same. But you're open to it, right? Yeah. Yeah. But still, even like my kind of dancing would be like, what was that Ed Sheeran song where he did like a ballroom dance? I think that would be my kind of dance, not like, what's this new Megan Megan the Stallion? Yeah, uh, that twerking. Uh, what's her name? Cardi B song? No, no, no. That's not, that's not me. I'll like maybe like in the that's next a couple bit of years. Spice, in a red dress. Where she, the cameras are focusing on the eyes, like it's out, like it feels like the industry is trying to just push that, right? I mean, for a reason, like when you understand, it's not even like an industry thing. It's just like... I don't understand that. Like It's, it's a Darwinian it's a, principle thing. When you ever Google the question, what makes someone attractive? It's always boiling down to like the biological encoded things that you know, charged with reproduction. That's why big bums are nice, white hips are nice, because they go to what? Reproduction, virility. Are they nice to everyone though? Is it is it a thing with everyone or it? I think now we, we have to like belong to a different spectrum. I think there are too many variables. Exactly. You know, I mean there's religion, there's culture, there's personal disposition. We live in an age where there's space for all those dimensions to express themselves. So I mean, people go and get implants of like horns and like do you feel like in their faces to express who they feel they are. So do you feel like being pretty is also helping your music? Oh Lord! Yeah. Wow, you know that clip where R Rihanna goes, "How disappointing was that question?" No, it's not disappointing. It's actually really <laughs> no. Like, do you feel like? Because let me tell you, right? I've been reading the comments about 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 people who find out about your music, right? Mm -hmm. Like I gave out tickets on Uvatam. I gave out about ten tickets mm -hmm. for people to come to Oktoberfest. So I just asked the marketing guys asked. I didn't ask. The marketing guys asked, uh, what do you know about Isabel? Da, 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 da. You said something you know about Isabel, you get yourself a ticket. And in every answer, she started her music in twenty sixteen. She's pretty. <laughs> She's a beautiful woman. Her music is good. She sings soul music. Like it was a constant, right? So you can't neglect it. Do you feel it as the creator, as the person doing the music, the, the music that is really good? Yeah. The, the, the pretty face doesn't take away the fact that the music is actually really good, right? Because we've seen pretty faces that have done good music and we've neglected it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I think I'm trying to like kind of process that even as you mentioned it right now. Mm -hmm. And like the two immediate like perspectives that come is one. And I don't know, I've never really considered myself pretty so like hear me out um i grew up with brothers that i was very close to you know i've always been one of the boys and prettiness is not something you really begin with because in any case from primary to secondary to 
university, all those sociological contexts where like the pretty girls or the popular girls, I was nothing like them. You know what I mean? So um, for me, what I have always found like something to boost me or when I imagine where people listening to me, it's always been related to some sort of cognitiveness. Like she said something smart or like she, that is something I, that's how I look at it. But then at the same time with the music industry and especially in Uganda, mm -hmm. like I think there's a distinction between pretty privilege and sexy privilege. Like I think culture doesn't want female musicians and even my experience to be pretty. They want them to be sexy. I remember one of the reasons I did not engage in performing, even when I had opportunities, especially when I was much younger, like in university, was the time I got um, this gig. And at that time, it was really just to grow my performance. Um, and I arrived and this guy was like, is that what you're wearing? And it was like jeans and a shirt. And it's not like the like buggy, anesthetic and stylish thing. It's like my style, but it's just not sexy feminine the way culture internalizes that and i was like no 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 no. any clarification when you're going this like what is it about my outfit that's wrong it's like and he just directly said can't you wear something more revealing like your female artist but listen, like uh an international interview where like some star i forget her name she's like they told me to wear revealing stuff yeah the other times people have told me like could you stop playing your instruments because then like you seem like too threatening when you go up on stage and you're playing your guitar or like you're playing um your piano it's just too much it's not the expectation of a female artist and yet like my artistry is really like all of all, all of that there's a time a friend of mine caught this in a clip in a recent interview where i was just introducing like my creative experience i'm like mm -hmm. i'm a singer i'm a songwriter um i'm an instrumentalist and i'm a producer and the person who was also female kind of went is a girl is a girl allowed to be all those things like is it is it even right like that was the essence of what she was saying and you know like i didn't feel any type of way yeah. about it because there's been so much work in understanding that no 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 this is what's around this is what the culture forces like females to internalize so it's not like i'm this baby who's like oh my god be yourself don't sexualize us. like write your own story if you want to shake booty shake booty that's like your in interpretation of your feminism but at the same time if this is my space and my interpretation of like my own personality even as a female i should have the freedom to take my peace with it so yeah i think that's that's my perspective on it but i wouldn't call it pretty privilege it's like sexy privilege man um, I'll give one last example. I don't know which season of The Voice it was. Asha was still a judge. Mm -hmm. And there was this obviously better singer. And it was the knock, what's that round? The knockout stages where like two people verse themselves and then one knocks the other one out and then advantage, advances to another yeah. stage. And then there was like this super pretty, sexy, maybe we didn't sing badly, but she didn't bring it like the other female did. And like, guess who won? The sexy one. Duh. And everyone was just like, mm, what's going on there? And like, Asha was just like, man, like when you look at the commercials of things, I have a better chance. You isn't know, being nurturing. sexy subjective though? Like, isn't it relative to who? But is it? Is it with what you're seeing? Like on like, social media? Yeah. Like with what I'm seeing, I don't find I spice sexy. I don't. It's always, what's her trend? There's like that. I don't find sexy thing real sexy. Thing that is but I see what they're trying to do. Yeah, but like, but I'm like okay, maybe you are like that 1% or that 10% or that, that demographic, but for sure, there's a template of what is sexy for women. Otherwise, people wouldn't be risking their lives getting BBLs in Colombia. So, like, for sure, you have to come to terms with that. Like, yeah, it just saves time. Plus, it, it works very well, as I said, with what's biologically encoded in us. So, yeah. That's my take on it. Okay. So yeah, also on the podcast with Kenneth, right? Mm -hmm. Which is my f one of my favorites on big conversations. Uh, it's like top three. It's so you speak of your bipolar disorder mm -hmm. and uh, you, you try and break it down because you're relating to Kanye West in the podcast. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that all my friends, right? Um, one of my friends, so I own, I own and produce very many podcasts. That's just not this. There's one I produce that is 
specifically just on mental health. Mm-hmm. It's a mind space podcast. So the guy that gave me the idea has a bipolar disorder. Mm-hmm. He's owned it, but he's super, super creative, right? Mm-hmm. Like he's super creative. Like he's been creative. He's been smart. When we were at college, he was acing. So I've always wondered how how does your disorder affect good and bad, right? Mm-hmm. Your creativity. All right. So before it affects it, there's a way it relates to it. Yeah. Um, and this is something I also saw in um other people. It was always creatives that had mental illnesses or mental disorders. Whether it's Van Gogh was in an asylum most of his life. Mm-hmm. All his happy pictures were in asylum. Like when he was really stable, that's where he was. Whether you go to Virginia Woolf, Sylvia Plath, that both committed suicide and they're like amazing creatives for me in loving these people's art and then realizing that mental struggles punctuated their lives I was like there has to be a synergy and when you look at what mental illnesses are they are a response to trauma right and what is trauma trauma so I also talked about this with Kenneth. Trauma is anything that we fail to process. Yeah. Right now, if we are here and like a, a cockroach jumps, yeah, yeah, we might like move a bit, but there has been enough information to know that I can probably just crush it or I can swipe it or whatever. Like it's not as harmful to me. Um, and biologically, that's that's us snapping from a disruption back to our baseline, right? So, um, homeostasis, I don't know if you remember your biology, when everything in an environment is perfect for, is perfect for like an organism or whatever to thrive. It's Mm. homeo, that environment, homeostasis, we have it in our bodies, but also have it like connected to our psychology and, you know, physiologically as well. So when it doesn't, when you're not able to snap back, that's allostasis, but our body works to teach us to adapt to trauma to survive. So a snake, for example, falling from the ceiling on this bed might be traumatic, but it won't compare (laughs) the same man, but it probably won't compare to like seeing your friend being shot dead because (laughs) it's harder to snap back into whatever it is, rationalizing that, accepting that, dealing with that. And why, creative people are usually mentally you know like suffering is because they're sensitive sensitivity is the intersection for someone to be creative they have to be sensitive to their own emotions they have to be sensitive to their own thoughts they're observing the world they're observing themselves in the world they're observing whatever it is and they're synthesizing that into various forms not just words but creatively if it's a poet she's rhyming and in that rhyming they're supposed to you know like evoke some sort of emotive reaction but then some cognitive tingling as well you know what i mean if it's someone making a movie they have to like make sure that at this scene the audience is crying and at this scene they're laughing and that takes a lot of mental will and power and sensitivity you have to know people to make art that moving and even before they're artists they're just sensitive people right Mm -hmm. so just imagine how much more life affects a sensitive person and there's this page i follow on social media as this person really just joking about like mental illness and the reality of it and basically what they were saying is that all those teenage people who used to write in their journals, I'm like, I'm so sensitive, I'm so emo. How is like therapy and like your diagnosis going? Cause that was me. I always used to feel really affected by things from from childhood. If my parents punished me, it and it wasn't just a punishment. I think my brothers could rationalize, yeah, yeah, yeah. They've caned us or they've punished us, we'll be fine. I'm just like, am I a bad child? Am I a bad person? What is my future? Like, are they bad? Like, I'd over dig into things. And my mom in life, you know, like, as parents say, you know, have a good day or like, be safe, be careful. Has to me is like, don't overthink things. Because that's just always, 
always been me. So I think it makes me a great creative, but automatically just the dissonance, um, which is where most trauma comes from. You have a position in your mind and you meet a position you can't, you know, synthesize that dissonance. And failing to fix that dissonance is what causes trauma. And when I look back in life, um, that's what began the signs of my bipolar 2. And it's for a very specific reason that it's bipolar 2. Because bipolar 2 is characterized more by bouts of depression. Mm -hmm. Which is different from Kanye West, which is like more manic. Yeah. And for me, the seat of that depression is just powerlessness. Like when I can't make it up mentally in my mind, I don't know what else to do, I just shut down. So part of growth and gaining stability in the past six years has been, you know what, accept. You don't have to know everything, you can control everything, or, um, you know, just finding new avenues of, of making sense of what cannot be made sense of. Do you yeah. notice how that affects your perspective to life? Yeah, yeah, I think, one of the major things it tells me is that to some extent, we're always in pain. We're always in some sort of suffering, be it on like a mental scale or whatever. But what makes us is how we react to it. Because for a very long while, I was just like, why am I the one with this? Like, where am I the one who has to go to therapy? Where am I the one who is having like my depression physiologically express you know anemia or whatever it is or like headaches and migraines or actual sicknesses low immunity for a really long time i felt singled out by life uh -huh. but i think the same way life is it gives us different capabilities different weaknesses different different dispositions that make us express as different people and the first lesson in that is just because i express through a mental illness doesn't yeah. mean that because you're not you're not suffering in some way so my new my new mantra is life is pain tell everyone about it because like for me the most fundamental reality is pain for someone else know how mm -hmm. how how you come come to that right because right it feels like in this new age of social media people are so far away from the fact that life is actually full of suffering yeah, right? and yeah. pain. Yeah. They feel like life is glamorous. And you can't blame them. But you can't blame it feels them. like it's, it's, it's so weird that you could, I don't know, like my experiences, uh, my father hates me to talk about this because it feels like. Does your father watch the pod? Sometimes. He watches selects a few episodes. Just, just start saying, daddy don't watch this one. Daddy don't watch this one. So he, he says like, stop talking about the fact that you're on the street and stuff like that. Like that doesn't represent the brand. And uh, like, mm -hmm. and I hear him, right? Mm -hmm. Like I never fault him. My, my, my mistakes were because I was learning, but all the time I felt like I could come to the realization that it's really from suffering that we realize how maybe happy, what, how we define happiness and stuff like that. But it feels like everyone else is oblivion to that fact that, you know what you pain is a well, pain is a good teacher. Right. Pain is part of life. And it's a yeah. constant. And it yeah. just never goes away. Yeah. And I think for yeah. me, why that is my outlook is my upbringing, to be honest. I had a very, very safe and secure and, you know, my parents were present. Upbringing was amazing. Until, yeah. <laughs> until I had to face life. And I was just like, what they teach me at home is very different from this reality. And... Um, most of what was inculcated in, in me as a firstborn daughter and my siblings was basically from a faith person. Yeah, I'm a firstborn. I'm a first girl. <laughs> first girls, how's therapy going? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. My sister is, should watch this. I should, right? She keeps the idea. No, but I can really connect the dots all the way back to my upbringing because yeah. my dad is a pastor and the essence of Christian religion is the establishment of sin, right? Mm -hmm. And the presence of sin that necessitates the Savior, Jesus Christ, to be our salvation, to die for our sins and save us, right? So the understanding of sin from childhood is something very uncomfortable that I was constantly leaning in, um, hearing every day in sermons, hearing in devotions at night and just realizing, you know, like, 
the world is bad and the world has sin because they are murderers. Jesus came so that like murderers don't be murderers anymore. Etc. Etc. And you know that childhood rationalization makes some sort of sense when all the bad is extrinsic and outside of you, right? Mm -hmm. Until you're in spaces with that, until you realize weaknesses and that same bad in yourself, like envy, jealousy, and just beginning with that taught me that to understand how I feel like this, like how, and one great example is like just like sexual church culture mm -hmm. because you know like flee sexual immorality and don't have lustful thoughts but sometimes church culture takes it to this level where you're basically repressing and denying your own sexuality as a human being yeah. and the first time i recall very vividly i think it was maybe when i was 17 years old a very attractive boy passed by and i was just like god you create and i was like Lord God Almighty, what are these thoughts I'm having? You know what I mean? And I was like, am I still saved? Am I still like born of the spirit? Am I a child of God? And there's only two conclusions in that, right? You're not, because you had those last four thoughts, which is like damning, because then what am I going to do in life? So the only option is you have to rationalize why you had those thoughts and how you're still a child of God. Be like, hmm, when God creates us, da, 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 da. So I have this practice of leaning into uncomfortable things. And people think when Isabel talks about pain and suffering all the time, she's just like a depressed, like putting us down all the time. But I think there's a sort of comfort I have in that perspective mm -hmm. from leaning into it, which is why I also can't blame people for not leaning into it because it takes practice to lean into it. And at the same time, it's not just pain. Sometimes people's core realities are humor, joy. You know, like comedians, I like listening to where Trevor Noah comes from. Yeah. Like everything I see just comes from a humorous point or like everything. I have friends who are just like super optimistic and I'm just like, is there something wrong with you? Until you realize, no, that's just where they come from. That's just their outlook on life. So for me, I always begin from the difficulty of a situation and just like emphasizes everything else, how good it is. It's like, for me, I know the joy of food from hunger. Oh, I know like how warm a blanket is from like not having, you know, a blanket. Yet other people can just begin from this food is really nice and I appreciate it. So I've also just accepted that because for a while I was just like, there's something wrong with me. Like why is pain my fundamental reality? But yeah, I feel at the core of it is whether it's joy, whether it's humor, the mistake is running away from it. And just saying because it's not popular. It's not what people do. Or there's a variation in my outlook that I'm seeing from... um from people, there's something wrong with me. So I'm all about accept yourself. That's also like something I'm really about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've been talking about pain, right? So here, pain, how have you handled uh, being an artist? You also a mom. Mm -hmm. Have you handled adversity in your life in general? Yeah, how are you coping up? Dramatically. <laughs> That's how I've handled it, but. Dramatically? Yeah, yeah. Cause they, what do you mean? You know, like. First of all, I don't know. You you keep referring to drama, but I don't see any drama. Okay. What I okay, the essence of drama is some sort of exaggeration or hyperbole, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know, as this kind of person, if like my best friend was like backbiting me, I'd like be so broken. Yeah. I'd just be like, Okay, okay, yeah, that wasn't a bad thing, but like does it warrant this reaction? And it goes back to my sensitivity because for a very long time things that caused me pain, genuine, genuine pain. I had to always match to other people's reactions, you know? It's like medically as well, people have different pain skills. And surprisingly have, very not surprisingly, I have a really high physical pain threshold. And I remember like going to labor and my doctor was just like, I usually haven't taken anything for this pain. And I was just like, no, but at the same what time... What do you mean? You just give birth? No, like, of course, it was a very complicated delivery and I didn't, I wasn't able it to... It was naturally. Like, no, I wasn't able to have it naturally because of that. But I still did go through labor for about seven hours before the decision to have a C-section was made. But still the way I handled that was different or like strange to him. Or like my mother, for example, mm -hmm. when she sees tears, she's just like, let's rush to the hospital. 
because that's when she knows that like my pain is really pain it takes a while for me to express that well at the same time the people who will be in the labor ward and they are screaming their lungs off and you're just like yeah, okay yeah you're having a baby and you live by yeah. mm-hmm. so i think it's like the same principle that is applied our assessment to express yes you know the nurses even come and slap you i know me i've been in level one you know the whole time yes and pretty pretty interesting like there are people screaming and i was like i'm in pain but i'm not going to scream that i'm like people start speaking their own languages and whatnot so i think even emotionally um or just yeah psychological pain the same principles apply Mm -hmm. you use your own assessment of what would be painful to you to imagine what is painful to another person so when i say i've handled adversity really dramatically i mean it especially particular relational things that like i don't know betrayal deceitfulness those things i really struggle really hard to forgive and like when i look at like my 21 year old self and now um i think there's a bit of growth with realizing that you know with what happens in the world you need to expect these kinds of expressions of adversity but at the same time i have to say faith faith in two different dimensions has helped me cuz um you know i came from this very you know rainbow the sky is blue jesus is lord all things work for good like this very spiritual um positive outlook to then face my own you know as you rightly said it personal adversities to then caused me to need to re-rationalize that and now i can still affirm to some of those principles but from a very different perspective yeah. it's like for now it's like the realization of like do you categorize the tsunami when it comes as a bad thing like can you persona personify it and say that it's malevolent or it's no it's just nature and for me that's just been my lesson life is life there's a great comfort in realizing that life is impartial maybe people are not people have bad motives but it's part of the category of life you will find good people you'll find bad people plus people are too complex for someone to be completely good completely bad you are not completely good you're not completely bad so why do you feel you... the same about yourself yeah i think um my own struggles have helped me um empathize more with people and have increased my compassion for them especially in the moments where i've needed that compassion you know when you fail a friend when you fail your family in some sort of way and you can look back and be like i should have done better is the excuse i didn't know better no their heart was real their heart was valid but there is a benefit from their forgiveness for example or their choice to say i don't understand that um but but i love you anyway and i think that's kind of the relationship i have with my family right now cuz they're just like half the stuff you choose to do from how we raise you and what we stand for it doesn't make sense for, you know no? most of it yeah, yeah yeah like if you know my upbringing and if you've been in like the church spaces that we are for sure i mean like recently i have this this picture with a friend of mine when i'm picking him do the thing like shook shook foundations like just in like mutual societal spaces so my mom's been getting all these messages of like uh huh and i'm just like it's just a pick plus it's super promotional like it's it's supposed to bring that reaction out it's supposed to grab your attention because we have something we're promoting that's coming out that we're both in and yeah so like i can't wait for her reaction to this <laughs> probably why i do stuff like this because i'm just like it's fascinating to me i've never had the permission to do things like this let me tell my uh, like giving myself a permission to do those things so yeah um but still amidst that like i remember her young reaction when like i found out she was doing blankets and i was so excited i kept telling mama i'm doing blankets and wine she's like wine wine why are you going to sing for people who drink wine and i had to explain to her no this is a festival like this da, 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 da. and she's just like seeing that it brings you joy and like if she could advise and she did advise like you don't have to do stuff like that but i'm like no no i'm making a personal decision to do that for my musical career she can still respect it she can still love you she can still be your mother those are some of the things that have taught me that just because you think differently from people just because 
of those differences in thought you cause whatever heart or misunderstanding to each other it doesn't mean you can't in principle be there for them so those are just examples of the growth but yeah complexity of myself really has done a lot of work in helping me deal with the complexities i find in other people and art is like center stage is like the space where that happens yeah how do you create with all this going on in your life I think it's like breathing to me. It's like um you know how when good news happen like let me ask you if right now the best news happened who would be the first person you'd call when the best news happened yeah, yeah you're just like it's itching like you're not even thinking like your your hand is picking up the phone like this is the person I'm going to tell my elder sister you get or like if you have this bad situation if you're in trouble the first person you're going to talk my to elder sister. yeah so it's the same thing for me like the first thing I probably dial is the expression of my own feelings. So there's this um meme that I posted recently of the notes app like saying that this 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 app has really seen sides of me. When I'm angry for example, I have to like express that anger when I'm sad and it right. Most of the time those thoughts as expressed in words turn into songs, turn into melodies and in a sense my whole creative process comes from from how i feel from what i experience um even if it's something i've never been through um the ability to empathize and imagine if i was going through that what most likely would be how i felt about that how would i express that that's where it comes from so my process is like breathing in that sense and i write a lot about that on my blog are you going an artist yeah how sometimes art and expression not necessarily just through songs but especially through words to me is like a, another way of being because of the value of processing yeah it helps me process so this is like the importance of self expression to you yeah i think it's inevitable i think it's something we all do in just different ways because we're dealing you either you had a flexible should you at 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 the have your stone this podcast and that's just Cute. people i over talk something in me tells me that like i would not it's have not the discipline of like letting people talk but the the thing about this podcast it's that like it it doesn't matter how it's talking like a discussion yeah. i like that i think that's why like i do this pod yeah so cool yeah but no that's why i write my thoughts anyway and like they're heavy and they're long and they'll get a couple of reads but it's more for me like expression always is about me and like in a sense that psychologically where it begins art is always for the artist yeah So, so because you're an artist, do you feel like expressing yourself gives away too much of you to the world? Yeah, I've really struggled with that and struggled with that um much more in my older age surprisingly because of like the societal implications. Once you're married, once you have a child, once you're a certain age, like Gabriel Union posts a picture in a bikini and guys are like But how old are you should you be doing that that Ashanti is always in a bikini and we're happy about it yeah but she's a Ash- Ashanti so like you see i don't want to call them the double standards but just yeah. the surface I mean, the surface perspectives from people so um something that i've had to lean into only because i've experienced how detrimental the other side is is expressing and being vulnerable anyway because you know there's a time i reach where whether it was my tweets or my musical taste or my music or my dressing all of it earlier today you said your 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 wardrobe was very intentional yeah yeah i think for me style is also a part of self expression and for me that yeah, primary you principle the first, man. thank you comfort I don't want to be in like something I'm pulling down or I feel like oh my god this is going to like tear or like I need to suck my tummy in or I need to make sure my back is straight for the pictures I mean all those things are important but like I'd rather just not be thinking about that as I'm performing but at the same time I want to feel nice so good, good, good shot. yeah comfort yeah I like that picture it might be pretty even right now um comfort is key for me well for other people it's other priorities so in self expression it's really me centric wherever wherever you begin whether it's my my style my dressing my my music kind of everything has to begin from me because it's for me so 
yeah, I think that's what. And what do you think about marriage? For someone who has been married, I think it's difficult. Um, and not because of the generic things, but I think, you know, we've been talking about the complexity of people. Yeah. Like it doesn't get more complex than that. Just imagine the level of intimacy on all levels, like in every single way, someone knows your thoughts, someone hears you snore, someone, you know, sees the best parts of you, someone sees the worst parts of you. And what it requires is maturity because you have to look at those parts in someone else that you don't like, right? And make a decision, right? Yeah. Say, I'm going to love you nonetheless, or I'm going to stay around nonetheless, or sometimes it's a realization that was a facade, right? Which is what we're all going through. I mean, like dealing with people, you can't really trust that who they present themselves to be is who they are. But as I said, life it's powerful. is impartial. It's part of figuring life out. What are you going to do with that decision, right? It's up to you. So for me, I think marriage is only different from any other relationship that we typically have in life because of the proximity. Yeah. But whether it's your child, whether it's your boss, whether it's your colleague, whether it's the driver, whether it's a stranger in the shop, they have the same complexities and therefore the same abilities to bring you joy, to arc you, to downright annoy you. The difference is at work you live, the shop you walk out. The child, maybe, I don't know, whatever you do, maybe you beat them, you get the nanny, you get some space, but the husband, the wife is for life. And I think psychologically as well, there's that pressure of like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. There's like some relational claustrophobia that culturally can can exist because of of those realities but i think i learned it from my parents having had my own experience of maturity of, of marriage like that required maturity yeah. like i always used to look at their marriage and think oh my goodness they've been together so long because it's been perfect it's been perfect for these reasons but to realize that they've gone through very normal difficulties in marriage it's just the maturity to make that decision to stay I not just to stay because, man, I made a vow, I have to stay, but there's a reason I want to stay. There's a home we've built. There's children we're raising. There's an example we're setting. Whatever it is, they find their why, mm -hmm. and, and it really centers them. But it feels like, so when you look at what has been happening on the internet, right? There's yeah. been a thread on marriage. Yeah, like the Twitter thing. People, yeah, the Twitter mm -hmm. thing. So there's all this new truth to it like mm -hmm. it seems like no one married is happy right like okay happy is an overstatement right because the definition is broad and relative to <clears throat> to a subject but it feels like everyone everyone doesn't commit for the actual purpose of it like everyone is just living a lie when they get married yeah and i think it's because to begin with we fall for a lie i think i can testify to that myself some of the reasons and primary ones to be exact for my marriage, when I look back, were super naive to begin with. I mean, the fleetingness of happiness should not be a reason for you to get into anything. I mean, we go and get jobs and we're like, I'm going to ball. I'm married, man. Look at I'm going to ball. I'm going to like make all this money. I'm going to go for the vacations. I'm going to have this image, this prestige from my job. And then we sit down when they give us work and we're like, I'm so stressed. I'm so put off by this work. There has to be a reconciliation of the full spectrum of what things are. So how, I don't know where we get it from. I think it's some sort of es escape. I don't know if it's Hollywood and movies. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it was Disney. Like my husband was always supposed to be my savior like provide for me, like make me happy, be my best friend, be my partner, listen to, to, you know what I'm saying. And there was a real rude awakening when that was not the case. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And as I said, I need for maturity. Um, so when these things happen, like especially like <laughs> farm, because like <laughs> when you see what's happening on the timeline, you yeah. realize People don't understand why they got married in the first place. And therefore, it's like mm -hmm, it's something people do. Mm -hmm, it's a milestone. So once you say I've gone into this to be happy, and there's nothing wrong with happiness. I'm not like saying that, but you have to understand 
we treasure happiness because it's fleeting. It comes, it goes, it comes, it goes. That's something too fleeting of a foundation. To what have makes you happy? Food. <laughs> food and sleeping. But at the same time... But, like, but really? Uh, yeah, for sure. Like, give me a good meal. Like, and after the meal. first three bites, I can cry tears of joy from, like, how <laughs> comforting that food is, I swear. <laughs> or just give me good sleep. You will know how happy it was making me from how I react when you wake me up. I've had to do a lot of work in like reeling in how I react to people waking me up because I can beat you. I'm just like, you know, so yeah. So I like, I think it makes me happy because it gives me peace. And I like how I feel after I eat. Maybe it's dopamine or whatever. And when I sleep, I wake up fresh, you know, and when they're not there, I'm really unhappy as well. So that brings me happiness. I think also finding spaces where people think and speak and see like you brings me a lot of happiness because sometimes um it's not it's not there you know like you can express a thought and people are like mm. but like for someone to say i've been thinking that and i've gone the same journey in arriving at a similar conclusion that also i think it brings me joy i think there's a distinction between joy and happiness yeah food and sleep happiness yeah that brings you happiness man and bring me happiness money money that's so true but uh because of our access it gives you right yeah comfort really mm. yeah it brings that the comfort it comes so much money. you think if you didn't have money you'd be unhappy no i've also really 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 learned over time to detach right i've lost some really close important things to me i've lost what i think what i'd made up in my mind was like family mm -hmm. and when i lost that i was able because I, I remember when i lost that i lost a top job right after like six months and it didn't mean anything right i yeah i was, I was, I was developing a lot of cool stuff so when i lost that i was like okay now since i've lost something very good like everything just didn't make that much sense mm -hmm. and i've been like that for good it's just this place is uh, i stopped staying here i was like okay fine i can just go off this like i literally started living on the street when i have a home in tinder of my parents i could go back to them so i've learned to detach from things wholeheartedly yeah because you have to rationalize the fact that the good part is not the whole story exactly yeah. exactly yeah. that yeah. i get that so i think it's the same thing so i don't know how i define my happiness really uh, how do you define yours i think happiness has it's also very will. fleeting right it yeah, just it's its own will it comes and goes when it i feel like there are things that bring me happiness like sleeping i never like six years ago i don't think that would bring me joy like binge watching a really good series bring me so much happiness right now i can't relate to that so i understand in that other dimension of its fleeting nature that it comes and goes but something more foundational is contentment and that's what I aim for now. That's also my definition of success. And not contentment in the sense that what I have now is all I'll ever need. And it's yeah. enough and I should be humble. I think there's such a misconstruction of it. But I'm happy with that, but that I have. Yeah, there is a, a, yeah. a perspective that I have to know that what I have right now is enough for now. When I need to step it up, I'll seek something else. And I'll make the practical decisions too. You know? And that is something I practice on like a daily for me like it's important what I have now is it's oh, you stuff. run mad man you run mad like gets crazy yeah gets crazy rationalizing why other people have things and you don't or why you put your efforts to things and you don't have them or why you have the things and they don't bring you happiness and the joy you thought that would come so i think for me my lesson is contentment is where it's at because even with adversity i used to be like why me why me why me why me and be like don't find solace from saying ah, at least i'm not like the other person but at the same time just perspectivize where you're at with where you can go or it is what it is that's another version of like that proper outlook for me not in like this defeatist i can't do things um like I, i've resigned to what i can do but it's a very good beginning for actual growth i think i forget who says but it's like a uh, it comes from stoicism, like I think one has one of those dimensions. And, and the principle really is wisdom begins when you accept you don't know. Yeah. It's like someone who does not, um, someone who 
insist that they know they can't learn exactly. they're not teachable um so even rationalizing life begins with beginning where you are and i think contentment is such a huge thing yet our versions of happiness is i deserve this i expect this, this is what's supposed to happen and sometimes that can fit you in the wrong spaces yeah that's my own assessment yeah i like food <laughs> I need to have yes, my co-host. I need to like work out a budget with my wagaga. They wanna say and get you on this podcast. I, I really, really like your perspective to life. I am saying this a million times to everyone that listens into this podcast. I appreciate so, that. What? What? The question is running away from me. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. How are you handling this month? being a mother thing though being a creative like how does it i think motherhood is one of the biggest shocks in my life mm-hmm. at the time i found out i was expecting for a very long time i had just resigned to the fact that i was not interested in motherhood and i was incapable of being a mother because that was like the most confused time in my life it was about 24 25 i didn't figure stuff out about myself i'd imposed like this deadline of 25 years and there I was expecting and I was just like I feel so sorry for this kid I'm really going to mess up their lives but at the same time I found such joy um from it in you know beginning with empathizing like if I was my son at two years what do I manage what do I imagine he would he would need he'd need his curiosity to be met he would need emotional availability he would need provision he would need you know everything that gives him the best opportunity at life and at something i'm so passionate about he's such he is such a motivator for so much of my life like i feel to be a better person it's because of him like he requires maturity from me for example like that thing of waking up angry when people wake you up from sleep you can come so excitedly from somewhere else and you're like deep in like some a dream of a dream of a dream you like that inception level and it's really good and he's just screaming from you saying mommy 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 and you have to teach yourself that like, he yeah, is right. genuinely yeah. excited about the cat doing this for you, you have you been uh, have you lived with a dog no i don't like animals ah uh, okay i've lived i've tried to live with a dog it got lost when i should just it got lost yeah, for real yeah it's just a god lost man wow, <laughs> just a god lost i i still feel hard about it so this is what happens right uh-huh. it moves out it's raining heavily in nadia we just moved to a new studio uh-huh. so i think it tries to trace the old studio oh, so because it's like it 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 yeah yeah i leave it at a studio i didn't get lost like like, like that <laughs> so dogs usually leave max but it rained heavily that day it could not trace its way back home again but the thing about dogs is they're going to love you like it's frustrating sometimes like yeah. you come back with so much anger and will be there Boo! so it was a house dog right it's it's, it's a japanese piece so to just move in and jump on you like okay now it would really really bring out the, the whole aspect of living with a child so cuz mm-hmm. i raised my child until he was 3 years as just living with him alone now in that time it would be very very shocking at some point i was going to take my life right as tired as frustrated mm. as depressed as like oh my god like this is the only one thing i looked out for for life by the way mm. was just to be in a certain like companionship and have that so then i i try to get that very very early before i before i was really knowledgeable about so many things i just thought i could just do it because my dad could do it and that's mm. all i had seen so the the realization that that was not happening and the fact that at some point then my child would have because I blame myself so much for the fact that my child would have a stepmom and I do not like the idea of step parents so mm. it it threw me your back and got so depressed so this one time I was ready to end my life mm-hmm. my son moves from his room he wakes up and I was like This is the first time I'm talking about this. No, I told you to my brother, I think at some point. So, I was done and put up a rope like I was taking my life. Dude. It was that crazy. So, he walks in and he smiles. He was crawling at that stage. So, because the mom had left us, it was so stressing. It was very 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 bad for me in that time. Mm-hmm. So, he walks from his room to the room like he came smiling. Then I looked at a baby smiling like this, mm-hmm. but has done 
has really done as like you know what mm. i didn't want to stress family i didn't want to do anything i felt like okay now nah, disappointed everyone who had so much hope in me mm. and that was it so yeah i i get that like you have to go back into that aspect of the being genuine because that smile was genuine they they didn't even care if there was sugar at home mm. they know what they were just happy they in, just in love that. you for showing up yeah. you know and like it's also pretty it's heavy bam and it's also pretty brave that like you're able to share and talk about that cuz like for someone who struggles with depression like there are days when it's pretty dark yeah. yeah and like you know you've written it down somewhere in some affirmation well I'm telling you what I'm pretty like, optimistic with life but the time I got to that point, it was just too much. Yeah, yeah. Because it's like, I've always been that person. Like, yeah. my elder sister is about five years, I think, six yeah. years ahead of me. But she just counts on my energy all the time. She's like, you know what? You are the guy. You are the guy. She's always like, your energy. But but she was very shocked because in that time, I also told talked to her like after, like after, I think, four months. Mm -hmm. Like, by the way, I went through this with that person and mm -hmm. I don't want to go back there again ever. Mm -hmm. It was draining. It, but Did just the thought of it all the time. I, I think about it. I was like, okay, this little thing really gave me my life. Like it came and smiled. Yeah. Like it was so shocking because it came crying from the bed, but then it I had the energy it. to like scroll. Then it saw me. Then it smiled right immediately. Like and the small things that make me believe in God, man. Like I think even before I found out I was I was expecting, it was a pretty pretty dark time in my life, and I think like. The fact that, um, you know, just having that baby and, and growing that baby gave me some time to reevaluate, re like, the usefulness and, and purpose in living. But I have to ask you, as someone who's, like, also been to, like, pretty dark places in that sense, from, from life situations and, you know, psychological adversity, where does the strength and the vulnerability and the comfortableness to say that publicly right now come from knowing that you know like if this is like a twitter clip people can run with it and like have yeah. their own narrative and and their own opinion and and yeah there's like just a lot that's ripe for stigma so i i grew up noticing that right the trends of how people like react to stuff mm -hmm. then how being offended because maybe i used to offend people by, by just speaking things and they would offend a few people how they would react and how I'd take it i'll be like okay like i really didn't mean that in that way mm -hmm. but it's affecting you like this yeah so i take everything literally right like i'm speaking my truth and that is just it it's my personal truth yeah, yeah. it's my personal truth yeah. it's me with the whole control over it yeah you're just listening to me yeah and that's that's all to me like i i've learned to to understand that whatever everyone else sees is just the surface of me yeah they don't know the real you yeah. and even if they did like who cares like it's thank you me expressing yes. this life this existence and you think that your podcast and what it's talking about the people you're inviting the people you choose to invite, the settings you choose to shoot in, how do you think um, that's contributing to that opinion? Like, speak your truth, speak your personal truth. So that's the whole thing. It, do you think it it's doing anything? To, yeah, mm -hmm. it just shows that I have full control of what I want to publish. Like, it's firstly about me and you right mm -hmm. now, the mm -hmm. people that are having the conversation. Yeah. It's how we feel about it. Yeah. It's, it's We know that this is just us having a conversation in the bed yeah and it builds to nothing it's about nothing it's something we've talked about to like okay let's just have a setup in the bed yeah and we've, we're yeah. having it yeah so, Bobby, first of all, let's like real real like pivot into that yeah you really need to explain to people why we're in a bed shooting a podcast really it's, it's about the drag thing i was like okay i i think because the interview was very boring and very was it yeah i think it was very boring no i think it was different you know like I know in a 
time. Like, why are you saying you don't know Lil Wayne on a podcast? Like, who says that? Because it's impossible. Like, okay, exactly. you're just saying it because you know it will take our attention. Exactly. Be mad about it. Exactly. Like, don't you guys? But I'm not trying to do that, by the way. And I've got backlash on that because when uh, this podcast is actually not just done by me, right? Yeah. There's a whole team after that's going to do the editing, that's going to do the short clips, that's going to do the social media. I do not like listening to myself. This is, I edit everything else at studio apart from this podcast. Because it's me who hosts the most. Because you're self-critical of your Yeah, own. that. Like, exactly. I'll yeah. be like, okay, no, I didn't want to say this. Take it out. Then it will kill the whole conversation. So I don't want to get into such a place. Or I don't want to, to waste people's time to that yeah. level. This yeah. guy will set up all these cameras and the lights. So when yeah. you start telling them that's not being published, they'll feel some type of way about it because they put in energy. So I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> We're talking about the Bobby and Drake thing and like the fact that um, you noticed she was doing that to like yeah, attract so people, but then you went into how like your own expression of that is. Okay, so let me just follow up in, in this sense then. Um, how do you balance your own relevance, right? From vulnerability, which is the point of a podcast, with the fact that it should be commercially viable. Because you know that if Bobby maybe was her real, real self, I mean, she's a 26 year old with two daughters, who got, she has a whole different life, but she wants to create a space for people to talk about things from a different angle. Like her whole ethos is awkwardness, yeah. you know? Like what, what do you do when it's awkward and you have to sit there and say something? And what do you do when I, 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 I make it even more uncomfortable? I appreciate that. Yeah. So maybe sometimes the things she says, like, I don't know who Wayne is like, really? Like it's like saying, I don't know who Obama is. I'm like, well, we all know who Obama is. We all know, you know who Lil Wayne is. But at the same time, this kind of, um, reaction, you could say is useful in getting her out noticed. So like when you do this, like I know. Yeah, yeah, you like Drake and you appreciated that episode. I don't like it. Is, is it, you don't like Drake? I just okay. don't like podcast. So, for whatever reason, we got this idea to say this from <laughs> yeah, there. from Drake. Like, he's a superstar, he's a trend, he will set a trend and stuff like that. So, it's like, oh, it's cool. Like, people are actually going to see it. Then, why I chose you to do it? That's uh -huh. the bigger question there. Because it's super anti, uh, what's the word? Antithetical. Like, this is the last place Isabel would be. Exactly. That's exactly what I chose to do. It. Because yeah. everyone's just be like... What so were you like, doing in that bed with that Mark guy? Those are the, the questions. Why does this be so bad for you? Because, oh my God. No, I live for it. I think, <laughs> I think maybe at 50 years, there will be some sort of hindsight opinion of like, we get what you are trying to do, younger Isabel, but maybe this wasn't the way to do it. But for now, one of the ways of setting boundaries and being myself, because I'm really affected by, I think I'm a people pleaser. I think, think? yeah, I think I am like growing up in a very structured home in very structured settings. My default has always been what does the culture, what does the setting, what does mom and dad, what does, you know, whoever it is, what do they need? And one of the reasons I realize, or I've been realizing in the past year and a half that I can be a follower in some senses is because I've always thought that being myself was too outrageous, you know? So one of the ways I've been practicing, um, destroying the power, the fear of that has over me mm -hmm. is just by completely busting the bubble. Yeah. Like if people are just coming and saying, Isabel is gone. I'm like, okay, so you're going to give me more freedom to be myself like because a, nah, 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 nah. It's like, it's like, okay, you want to say I'm mad. Let me, let me show you that. Let I'm me show you madness. madness. Exactly. But I can show you madness in that sense but in some ways i can relate i think i relate a lot to his necessity to be himself um and do you feel like you're not yourself i think at so many levels yeah yeah i think there's i haven't even scratched the surface of like understanding who i am and that's something i'm really curious about which is why i'm so excited about my 30s um but at the same time it takes time it takes growth you can't just wake up and you're unafraid of the repercussions of making your own decisions like um, like when my marriage ended, it had repercussions on me and, and my husband be perceived in society, it had repercussions on my son and like him being in a healthy home. Um, how but, did you feel about that? Like the fact that there's no healthy home anymore. Okay. Health is relative. I think, I think it's something I'm, I'm just trusting to, to God cause man, 
what can I do? You know, True. like it became a very difficult, unpleasant and harmful situation to myself to stay. So, um, is it selfish that I chose myself in some sense? Um, I'm still grappling with that. I have to be honest. Um, I have to be honest about that. And I'm constantly thinking what trauma, what therapy is you going to need? How is this wound from growing up in a fractured home going to express in him? But at the same time, what can I do to change the past? You know, like I have to keep moving forward and doing the best thing for myself and for him. Because if he has a healthy, thriving mother, it is for him. And past couple of months have been testament to that. So I think it's it's something you, you have to balance. I think to be truly yourself is, is difficult. Um, there's this meme I saw where like kind of the context was this person was going to college and I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm so excited to be at college. I'm so excited to meet these new people. What advice do you have for me? And one of the comments was don't be yourself in the sense that there's so much, um, not hate, but just attention, um, different people get for whatever reasons and psychologically, of course, there's a rationale for it, but at the same time. I don't know why it's maybe the first question I'll ask God when I get audience with him is why it's, it's that diametrically opposed. Why is our core need to be seen, to be acknowledged, to be affirmed, to be understood, to be ourselves in that sense. But then the essence of our society and the core fear mm -hmm. is the difference of another person. When you dig down into antisemitism mm -hmm. in in what Prussia turned Germany was the fact that there were these immigrants who are Jews who are doing better yeah. than those, you know, the people at that time was it stemmed from a fear and then it turned into some hate. These people that are not even of this land, of this race, are doing better than us. You know, I was telling you about Hitler before, like when I read um, his biography and like his whole ethos for Mein Kampf and the Nazis was born in fear. I'm afraid of what people different from us can do because why do they get to thrive in their difference and I do not? Why me, the Austrian popa who had a passion for art, why is that the case? Why is it that the greatest nation, in my opinion, in the world is ashamed this way in World War mm. No, let's go back to the world and show them who we are. You know, when you dig down into who he was as a person, you see it come out and then you see the people that aligned with him the the people that came up with um Heinrich Himmler for example he came up with the whole uh Nazi gas gassing um concept in in the camps his literal question was what is the fastest way to kill Jews mm -hmm. and you know people think that sometimes it was just Jews but they had this whole theory that they called that stemmed from the idea that they were uber mentioned, which means like we're better people. And there was a genocide that occurred, you know, on this side, the Slavic areas, they're just killing them because they also believed like, you know, and they killed people so much that the, 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 the killing demoralized the soldiers. So they had to think now when these guys go on by, how do we think about it? So um, it's so diametrically opposed, right? Yeah. Like how can fear birth such such an occurrence like 10 years of suffering the world is changed from that so it tells me um that it's important to be yourself anyway and i think that's why kanye will live on whatever happens because whether it's his mania and his controversy um he was being himself even in the wrong so i, of I feel like that's that answers yeah. if you had asked me yeah like i am just always myself and i sometimes i can't control it yeah, because that's our default setting to yeah. say what we actually think, to ask what we actually inquire about. But then when there's this thing I like saying, I don't like cool people, you know, people who are always thinking about the right thing to say. Like you're right. cool person. No, cool. Listen to my but, passion of coolness. Yeah, you, you know, like that. I don't trust someone that everyone likes. They're the life of the party. They're the ones like, you know, like show me your... In the humanity. beginning, like I, I, I thought like you're that person, like... <laughs> 
she's saying good music she's a cool very curated statements what she want she's on the podcast saying says like Asian. something Asian. so when you told me all that i was like okay now this is exactly it yeah it makes sense yeah so for me i feel my passion is just to make people feel this weird about being themselves mm-hmm. even if it's just like okay i thought i was doing badly i listened what isabel said and she's doing badly i feel much better about myself i feel i don't know some sort of life purpose in that maybe something you took to my therapist about but yeah so for sure yeah keep on with the podcast keep on with inviting people that share their actual thoughts you keep come on back again yeah 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 if it's like an interesting setup maybe this time now we're at like the international space station and we're like in zero gravity like a zero gravity simulation and then we have to hold the mic and then you accidentally drop it and we see what happens okay i live for like yeah, i'm gonna put it back yeah let's do that zero, zero gravity simulation that's the next that's the next uh because i'm coming from like yeah you have it. something to ask isabel you you became a big fan from her performance at october first <laughs> mm. thanks fam very close one friend of mine thank you okay one person for me one question for me then we close all right yes mark karen wamala what does karen mean by the way uh, it's a name my mom gave me so i keep it because of that and then she passed on so makita is, is the popular nickname because mm-hmm. i had the games going on i had the just going on but it it, it it trails from like some love thing in primary can you imagine us in love with some chick called anita Anage, anita chewakola no, no, names then people picked up second like i had to destroy it all my relationship like, like can you change it no, no. so that. that's so interesting yeah hmm. you're saying last question mm-hmm. what have you made of life for now what do you think of life also think? with all the adversity no this is actually the last question with okay. all the adversity you've gone through and with your understanding of life right now how is it possible that you still have faith in god that's a good question um but i think it begins from the place of if i lose that hope what do you have what do you have and um i like philosophy because it meets some of these questions and existentialists live to answer this question so they say there's something called the absurd where the logical flow and expectation of life in our minds meets irrationalities right something absurd like your mother dying of cancer when you're a young child you need your mother somehow life has decided to be this absurd mm-hmm. so different existentialists have different um arguments for how to react to that and Camus was a really laissez fair guy who dealt with very very difficult questions and one of his answers was really really hard to believe but i think in some twisted way was my liberation um you just accept it you just give it a big hug and accept that it's absurd the moment you try to rationalize something absurd it's defeat it it can happen because the essence of an absurdity is it doesn't make any sense like in the ways you cognize you will not find a pattern coherent with something that is absurd. Yeah. So while he made other conclusions um for example that to depend on religion it's like a sort of psychological crutch or suicide is cowardice because this is what happens when you meet the absurd. We all have what they also call it the dark of the night. Like mm-hmm. those moments you meet yourself it's the hardest time and you become who you are. or um the buildings roman like when you look at the coming of age things that character goes through the worst that they thought would happen after it's happened somehow they are liberated dark night of the soul thank you yeah so um yeah they face that the worst that could happen and then after it happens they feel liberated because it happened and then i like what's this movie called um whiplash have you watched whiplash mm. So JK Simmons I forgot the director but, but really, watch it. really young guy so he's like this drama <laughs> and that just 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 band and like as, uh, the, the the conductor is like really really you know intense yeah. and his biggest fear ideally is to mess up or to not be good enough so he practiced crazily you know like his his hands would bleed and you know 
eventually his obsession with that um makes him fail so they have this big performance and in the middle of the performance like he blunders crazily and he stands up and walks out and as he's walking out facing that something just dawns on him like he's liberated he comes back and plays the best he's ever played and the movie ends with the conductor smiling and he's such a bully so it's like one of those screenplays another example is like black swan you know like how she was so obsessed with being good she denies herself she like sexualizes herself to get the part she gets a part and then she has to meet that part of her her liberation comes when she embraces the black swan that she was avoiding to be or didn't want to be. So I think there is that liberation in just giving sadity a big fat hug and saying, I don't know why you are. I don't know why you are, but for sure you are. Mm-hmm. And I think I found more peace with that. Stop asking yourself, why me? Why me? So not you should ask yourself, why not me? Like, just accept that it is what it is and do your best with what you can. Did you ever think about the why me in the positive bit of it yeah and i've been there man like nothing good comes from it you know even if it's what some sort of productivity i found it breeds like a lot of comparison it messes with your esteem messes with your self-concept but if you just begin from i can accept what i can't rationalize it's a, a healthier place to make the next decision than determining what life has not determined for you yeah that's what i can say the absurd is absurd uh, for uh, reason. but i've also made sense with that right that one thing i practice so much i'm going to say this in in very 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 awkward way so oh. the reason as to why i So in the beginning, I really, really, really had a problem with things not going my way, right? Mm-hmm. I am my last born to my mom, mm-hmm. and uh, my dad had to like get into another world and the whole thing. But you still get those favors, right? Yeah. You're the one they're introducing to. So I've grown up with that mentality of, you know what? All my uh, my dad keeps reminding me, every other child he had before me, they were renting, but he had me in a house, like I had built at. Mm-hmm. So he keeps reminding me of that. Tells me you have all the favors, Mark. Like you don't have a reason to complain with this life like mm-hmm. all the time like he keeps telling me that like yeah. at least with your case I've aligned you've never faulted on school fees or stuff like that and rightfully so mm-hmm. but still I feel like life is still that harsh yeah right yeah yeah and I, I have to that. live with that I hear that so dealing with that has been so hard but like now the imposition with time of his perspective yeah. of gratitude contentment success on your own experience with time though trying to like find like a relationship has taught me that things don't have to go your way yeah. all the time yeah. you just have to accept it yeah like regardless of what you do like it doesn't matter like things just can't fail to go your way yeah and yeah um i'm just trying to live with it i don't know if everyone just lives with it and they're like okay yeah and i feel like yeah at least i'm practicing a lot of contentment you have to have somewhere you begin that's a better foundation to begin from for sure so yeah keep doing what we're doing we i am asking eh? me no i'm concluding I'm going to ask. Yes. What did you ask? It's like half the questions in like this last se- segment. Okay. Okay. Cool. Me as shouting out to the podcast. Yeah. And the Yuva Tam team. No, um, one of people asked me, how do you choose who to work with, who to collaborate with? I know one major question is going to be, this is the second time you're on this podcast. I've had invitations to other podcasts, but like I choose to come to this podcast because of what it stands for i mean like i appreciate how vast the people you have um on are there's something to learn from someone all the time and so i just want to encourage you in that um and also thank you because i don't think there's any other space where being able to speak this freely my thoughts and you know legitimately have them overturned and like questions so i'm thankful to you to kenneth it's been really great experiences and yeah i'm looking forward to the bath backlash on twitter <laughs> this is a bad thing no but we have explained it it makes sense since when yes, we still need to keep your joke yeah like...
I still need you to keep your peace of mind, to be happy. I don't want you to love. We're going to practice what we preach. We're going to accept the cause and the effect. All right. Perfect. Yeah. He's a good preacher of that. Yeah. Cause and effect. Like, you have to yeah. do it all the time. All right. Thank you, Isabel, man. Peace.